Well, welcome everybody. We'll kick it off now. We've got uh, <laughs> gallery is uh, opened up. We got a good number of audience uh, now, and it's uh, a little bit after eleven. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us, uh, and I am very happy to uh, be here today with everyone to talk about exactly what's happening right now with streamlining patient screening during the epidemic and how this pandemic is really a, an agent of change, uh, as we've seen, uh, really revolutionary. And we don't use the word revolutionary very frequently, if, if ever, really. But this, is, this year has been revolutionary in terms of the adoption and diffusion of new digital technologies, and that's certainly affected patient screening. My name is Dr. Stan Kaczynski. I am the director of the Digital Health Program at Columbia Business School Executive Education, where we have four different certifications in digital health uh, strategy, investing, therapeutic approvals, and health data science. And this is a, uh, an extraordinary time uh, for digital transformation and Columbia Business School has responded to that by offering certifications so that enterprises can uh, understand how well people are trained in this area. Um, uh, again, this, is, uh, this panel uh, is a part of the HitLab Breakthrough uh, Network and uh, the, uh, the, really the, the breakthrough is a program to help accelerate the diffusion of digital through evidence-based testing and learning and publishing of those results. And this panel has actually been brought to you by Medictor, who is uh, one of the breakthrough uh, portfolio companies and technologies and uh, chosen because of their efficacy and then tested to prove their efficacy. And uh, we're, we're delighted to uh, certainly uh, be working with Medictor and certainly Vincent, Vincent uh, Ferrari, Fer Ferrara from New York City, uh, the New York City office uh, for Medictor. Uh, and with us as well on the panel is Dr. Uh, Dorosario, as well as Dr. Triola. Uh, Dr. Rosario is from New Haven Health, and Dr. Rosario, Dr. Triola is from NYU uh, Grossman School of Medicine. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. And the topic today is really um, understanding goals and, uh, and objectives for hospitals and health systems around uh, how their ability to uh, ensure quality care has been affected by the pandemic and how they're able to continue to deliver quality of care around the, uh, the patients and the, the communities that they serve during this area. And not just um, uh, on a regular basis, but during the pandemic and, and not just in a specific therapeutic area, but across the entire continuum. And so really, um, what I'd like to do is start with some basic introductions, some really maybe one or two minute overview uh, of each of the panelists. And Dr. Rosario, could you start us off as the Chief Population Health Officer for Yield New Haven? Tell us a little bit about what you do. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Arnold Rosario, and I'm a practicing physician and internist, have done so for decades. I also served as the Chief Medical Officer for Northeast Medical Group which is the ambulatory arm of Yale New Haven Health. And I currently serve as its chief population health officer. Fantastic. Um, Vincent. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for having me today, uh, Stan. Um, in my case, I am the managing director of uh, Meditor's New York City office. I joined the company over two years ago and I uh, coordinate and lead the expansion of Meditor into the North American market, uh, mainly uh, US and to a lesser extent, uh, Canada. Uh, for those in the audience that are not familiar with Meditor, uh, with our solution, um, what we do basically is enable both um, health systems and health plans to direct patients to the appropriate level of care, being that um, telemedicine, the specialist, emergency department, et cetera, by using our uh, leading AI-based uh, virtual triage solution. Uh, since its inception, Medictor has run uh, over 4 million consultations, uh, symptom assessments, and we have clients uh, worldwide. Um, back to my experience and background, just briefly, uh, before joining Medictor, I collaborated with uh, VC firms, uh, American VC firms in the healthcare industry. So I have experience in both uh, in the innovation ecosystem as an investor and uh, working for a startup. 
And before that, I served as an associate for corporate investment banking in Santander Bank from its New York City office. Um, regarding my background, is completely different from the other two panelists. Uh, background is uh, business administration and MBA with major in finance and strategic consultancy. And hopefully, uh, this different point of view perspective is going to reach today's uh, to this conversation. Back to you, Stan. That's fantastic. Thank you, Visang. That's great. And then uh, last but not least, of course, Dr. Triola from the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Dr. Triola. Thanks so much for having me uh, and for the opportunity to talk about this fascinating topic. I um, am an internal medicine physician with a background in health informatics. And uh, at NYU, I'm the Associate Dean for Educational Informatics. And I I'm the director of the Institute for Innovations in Medical Education, and we're a unique innovation group that's focused on digital solutions that span both our education mission, training the future workforce of healthcare, uh, and our, our evolving healthcare delivery system. Uh, and so this digital transformation that we're gonna talk about is a big part of the strategy across NYU, but also a, a, in ways that is really changing every aspect of, of healthcare from education to the patient, and to, and to clinical practice. So excited for the conversation. Love it. Yeah, as, as are we and our panelists. And just as a, uh, a quick reminder to the panel, to the, uh, the audience, um, it, we would love to have this become uh, really more of an interactive session than anything else. So if you could please uh, chat away in the chat box, we would love to get your questions. We know this is a, uh, a really critical topic in, uh, in this environment, in this day and age. So um, feel free to do that, uh, and uh, we would love to hear from you. And then again, obviously, if you would like to link in with anybody on the panel uh, about what they're doing, uh, please, uh, they're all active on LinkedIn, uh, please do that, and uh, uh, feel free to follow up on them as well uh, on their programs, or the program that I run at Columbia in digital health certifications. Um, love to get interaction with everyone there. Uh, so just to kick off the questions and really understand how technology can be utilized to facilitate the appropriate care levels within these patient populations. Uh, Dr. Rosario, tell us a little bit about that and, and how you've seen technology used to help facilitate this sort of, um, you know, kind of patient direct in here. As a, as a primary care physician, we all face challenges in delivery of healthcare, clearly accentuated during the pandemic. The fundamental question that we often pose is the following, you know, how do we get the right care at the right place at the right time? And I'm just gonna give you a very quick overview of a case that I experienced a few years ago, which piqued my interest. This is a 22 year old uh, male who had just graduated from college and rightfully so was out during the night celebrating. And I'm sure there was a, a celebratory dosing of uh, alcohol use during the evening. When he finally got home and he woke up in the morning, he complained to his girlfriend that he felt his heart was racing and uh, didn't feel well. She uh, called the local emergency room and spoke with a nurse. I'm sure there was exchange of uh, history may, may, may have not been accurate, but the nurse basically said, well, don't worry about it. Uh, make sure he's hydrated, no Red Bull, no caffeine, and he should be fine. Unfortunately, a few hours later, he got worse, and uh, they had to call 911, was taken to the hospital, and his uh, arrhythmia, which was probably atrial fibrillation, degenerated into a fatal arrhythmia, and they were not able to resuscitate him. You know, this does illustrate something that we rely on humans to often make a decision. We often, there's, there can be human bias given the age of what he was doing the evening before. We process this through a symptom checker app. And the result we got was, you know, you probably have a fibrillation, proceed to the nearest emergency room. This uh, patient had several hours and we all know that this would have been a reversible event. We face the same challenge when somebody calls our office. You know, most of our staff are not clinically trained. You know, it's too expensive to have RNs answer the phone. And depending on the kind of history the patients gave at that time and moment, they are 
sort of given an appointment, which may not be appropriate, uh, either two days later when they need a same day appointment or get directed to the emergency room when it's inappropriate. And so this is, this is a major challenge for us, given limited access to healthcare at the point of entry, we need technology to help us. Number one, even help our staff at the front desk to do some basic triage or maybe, and certainly a, a patient facing app where they can plug in their symptoms, get a sense of what may be the problem and how urgent the case might be. That's where I see the greatest value in how we can deliver care. Brilliant. Um, I think that's really where we see, you know, a lot of these technologies helping out and really facilitating, you know, these improved outcomes. So spot on there. Thank you, Dr. Sar. Anyone, uh, any, uh, you know, Dr. Triola or Vincent, any other uh, comments and, and uh, follow-ups on, on, on where this is coming into play? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um... There is uh, something that is going to help us answer this question, which is uh, understanding what people is doing now. Uh, Dr. De Rosario explained a clear case. Uh, there are many others, uh, and I would say that 70% of the time, uh, we know that people Google their symptoms, right? And this is something that is telling us how technology could help. So. Uh, patients, whenever they feel symptoms, they rush into Google, they Google symptoms, and we know how dangerous uh, Dr. Google uh, is, a uh, dangerous <laughs> doctor to visit, right? Uh, and everybody does that, uh, never mind. And the reason why people is going to Google, uh, the answer is because of two factors. The first one, in an Uberized uh, economy where uh, consumers get whatever they want, anytime and anywhere, Whenever they feel symptoms, they want an answer. And the immediate answer is going online, Googling. But there is also a second factor that affects uh, the predisposition of people towards technology. is the fact that uh, if we contemplate the American healthcare system as a whole, we see that uh, risk has shifted uh, from health plans to health systems. And this is shifting very rapidly towards the consumer. So the patient, when they feel symptoms, and they are in a situation where they need answers for which they don't have proper tools. If you combine both, you understand why people visit Dr. Google. So uh, our approach is the following. Why don't we use uh, the patient's uh, intuitive reaction, the consumer's reflex, to go online where health systems could provide them uh, via website, app, tools to funnel this demand on a safe, convenient, and cost-effective way. And by the way, you could offer them personalized on-demand healthcare guidance because the technology allows this. It's just about you know taking the next step because the field is open. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly uh, what we're seeing. And uh, along those lines, when we begin to take a look at even uh, other opportunities for digital interventions in the ecosystem. We, we really begin to look at the overwhelming patient load. And that's one of the things that I know in, in the, 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 uh, the conversation ahead of time in, in talking with you all about the, uh, this topic, uh, that was something that did come up and that was a, uh, a major issue, was just you know, what's happening with the pandemic and, and how are hospitals and health systems actually able to implement digital solutions that can actually provide patients with some sort of personalized guidance uh, prior to a visit. That's really critical. It's, it's really a, this new idea that's not really a new idea, but now it's being diffused rapidly in the healthcare system, which is how can we do a, a pre-hospital triage with digital technologies in, you know, again, Dr. Triola, with what you're doing at NYU, tell us a little bit about how NYU has responded with this sort of, uh, this sort of concept. Um, so I think that, first of all, I think that though COVID has taken this situation to the extreme, the concept of feeling of uh, being overwhelmed with patient load is one that has existed for a long time in most healthcare settings and most healthcare systems. And it's not just being overwhelmed with the load of the individual patient in front of you, but as we develop greater systems and technologies, the data density per patient 
both the amount of panoramic information we have about each of our patients and also how frequently we're collecting that information is growing exponentially. And so the, the, uh, the, the, um, the challenge is, is, is quite real and it's an exponential one. And I think that um, speaking to Medictora and other products, the key will be having this artificial intelligence or machine learning member of the healthcare team between us and this growing amount of, of data and this growing amount of patients. Um, there's just no way that we as humans can keep up with all of this and nor should we even have to look at the majority of the data collected. We should focus our attention where it is, where it is most needed and uh, most effective and impactful. When it comes to um, pre-hospital screening, when it comes to triage, much of which, by the way, is increasingly decoupled from the actual hospital and healthcare system and our products and services that are offered by a growing ecosystem of companies that are um, working alongside the traditional models of healthcare and hospital systems, but ones that consumers and patients can, can connect with directly. One of the big challenges I think is going to be the, the patient really understanding and using all the information and guidance that they're given to make good healthcare decisions. Um, we talked about the immediacy and the type of provider that they should see. Um, when what we've seen a lot with COVID is the lack of the penetration of the message and the healthcare guidance to large numbers of the, of the population. Some of this has to do with the fact that many of these things are about probabilities or uncertainty and understanding what to do is about weighing risks and benefits. And that's something that, that is still a challenge for patients to understand and leverage when they're certainly when they're in the outpatient setting and certainly when they're less tethered to that healthcare system and consuming things that are, that are purely, um, purely digital. Um, I think that when we also, when we talk about the pre-hospital visit and guidance prior to the visit, digital health and health technologies are gonna change the concept of what a visit is. The, the periodicity or the patient really interfacing with the healthcare system once or twice or three times a year is something that will change over time as technologies allow us to have this, more of this real-time streaming and panoramic relationship with our patients. Again, something that is really complicated for us to handle uh, on, the, on the physician side and the hospital side because we don't have more time to look at all of that data, to think about it. We're gonna need help from our artificially intelligent and machine learning friends that are mostly coming from the private sector and companies that can really um, create this e interconnected ecosystem of solutions and services. And so what this will all really look like is this amazing ability to reach out and to gather information from our patients, to give them guidance that is evidence-based and constantly evolves as we gather more and more data, but being thoughtful about how to use that data and gain insight from it, and how to help our physicians and our hospitals and our nurses and our care managers make decisions on top of it without becoming overwhelmed is gonna be the real key um, it, to, to foster an effective partnership between doctors and patients in this, in this new future going forward. That's great. We actually have a question already coming in from Adriana uh, about uh, the legal and liability issues uh, and any kind of legislation around how risk uh, can be reduced if the academy supports certain information. Um, can, can we talk about that a little bit and, and um, talk about the, the legal and liability issues here? Um, in terms of liability, uh, when um, providing healthcare guidance, uh, this is the, the angle of the question. Yeah. So I would say basically that uh, when it comes to automation, uh, we have to be, as consumers, uh, very relaxed in the sense that we have associations, organizations like the FDA here in the States. EMA in Europe, that they take this very seriously. I mean, um, obviously they have to find these organisms, they have to find an equilibrium, a balance between empowering uh, innovators and protecting the patient. And uh, within the AI machine learning world, uh, there is nothing yet uh, concluded. These are ongoing conversations uh, that we are having with the FDA uh, and all parties. And what it's, it's good to see is that finally the FDA here in the States have decided to 
look at the AI machine learning world and something that they have to control somehow, uh, the same way they do with drugs and medi uh, medical technologies, but they understand that it has to do in a different way, in a different fashion. And by the way, AI is a big world where you can segment and differentiate different types of solutions. Uh, it's not the same if it's a consumer facing solution being used by a person with no clinical knowledge than if it's a solution that is used by a doctor with clinical knowledge. For instance, uh, those AI algorithms that allow you to identify lung cancer by examining uh, MRI slides, right? So uh, what we are seeing here is that uh, there is a true tell of, of, of control and this is what should matter uh, the, the, the consumers. And eventually <laughs> it's gonna be a trade of trust and transparency between the parties. And uh, the only way to achieve this is through clinical evidence. And that's something that we are seeing more and more within uh, digital health solu solutions uh, that betting for clinical evidence to uh, support their claims. You know, I see the, the legal uh, aspect a little differently. I think having no access to healthcare is a greater liability. So, you know, when they call my office and I can't see them for two days, I'm putting them at risk. Uh, I think the, the one difference that we have to talk about, quite frankly, when we talk about telehealth or virtual care, there is virtual care and there's virtual integrated care. In a system like ours, for example, when we do telehealth visits, we have the full medical record of the patient in front of us. They get to see their clinician who's familiar with them. And, and quite frankly, you use this in several different ways. One is to simply evaluate the patient or the, the symptoms in a very timely fashion. Uh, you can evaluate and treat if it's something simple that you can diagnose using telehealth and about 25% of the stuff in primary care we can. Uh, we can evaluate and direct the patient. Uh, also, a lot of our appointments are filled for follow-up. For example, if I see somebody with a condition that I treat medical legally, I have to close the loop. So what do I say to the patient? I'll see you in two weeks. That's quite frankly, not a good use of a face-to-face -face appointment time. Uh, but I need to close the loop for medical legal reasons because in case uh, things didn't go the way I anticipated. So, but we could do that with telehealth, for example. And very effectively, just to give you that same chronic disease management, for example, in diabetes, which is a real bugaboo for us, we have to see them. We can do that. And as Dr. Triola mentioned, I don't have to do it. My team can do a lot of that stuff. I could just review and give the input. So the team concept linked together. And I, I think today, for example, with telehealth, the platforms, you know, I can, I can, um, see a patient and at the same time have their caregiver daughter in a different state participate in that so that I do not have to make that second phone call to go over things. We have integrated interpreter services that we can link to. So there's in incredible potential. I, I'm not at all concerned about the medical legal aspect of what happens because uh, we do this very much over the phone with limited access to medical records after hours. I think this truly would enhance uh, patient care and patient safety. And just to add that, I think one other aspect of this, which is a different angle uh, when um, consumer digital health is, is introduced is advocacy for the patient. Um, it was meant, the FDA was mentioned and their digital health innovation action plan is a, a much more progressive way of thinking about what is um, subject to FDA approval and clearance and what this emerging world, which happens so much faster, the ability to generate and iterate an algorithm as opposed to create a new um, uh, pill for a cholesterol uh, control is, is a completely different world. But the other aspect of that is a need for a modernization of HIPAA in the context of all of this. HIPAA, which was originally in 1996, didn't really was about hospital and clinic generated data that was sort of owned and controlled by the hospital and the clinic. And here we are in this new world where the patient can generate their own health data in conjunction with a, a third party broker or a cloud um, oriented um, consumer provider. And a modernization of HIPAA that ensures that their data is well protected, that they have control over where it can go now that they have so many more options of sharing it and interconnecting it. I think it's gonna be an important component of this as part of um, the role for advocating for our patients as these things evolve. 
Yeah, it's a fantastic discussion. And, and again, <clears throat> I have to say, it's, it's wonderful having the three of you here to share your time during this hour on the panel, but we also have an extraordinarily rich audience uh, listening. Uh, professors from Emory and Hopkins uh, and uh, directors from Pfizer and uh, a couple of major uh, digital health venture funds. So uh, this is a lot of fun. We've got uh, another question coming in from the audience about the flow of data and, uh, and Google. You know, again, you, we mentioned Dr. Google. That's a great, uh, uh, it's a great term that people use, uh, unfortunately, a little bit too much these days. Um, and the question is really around uh, how, how could the three of you see Google playing a part in this? And maybe Vincent, you can lead off on this. But um, how do we see, uh, how do we see uh, these, these tools integrating with Google and uh, either through its algorithms or through you know, better SEO or whatever it might be uh, in terms of having, you know, that patient get better direction from Dr. Google when there's a search done, either whether it's a disclaimer or whether it's something in the search results, maybe you can lead off and then the, mm -hmm. Dr. Triola and Dr. Dirosaro, you guys can lead in after that. Exactly. So honestly, uh, we do know that Google, they have a healthcare division working for the last years. Uh, browsing a lot around, uh, contacting uh, companies in the space. Uh, one of the key movements of Google lately has been uh, investing in American Well. Uh, there is some sort of uh, gossip in the industry where you have on one end Teladoc and Livongo, Telongo, and on the other way, on the other side, you have uh, Google with American Well. And they are trying to position themselves to try to actually figure out how the whole piece are gonna fall together because nobody knows yet. Obviously there are different paths. Everybody is, uh, it's analyzing their own ways. Uh, but when you have like uh, big players like Google stepping into is because uh, something big is coming and something that we have mentioned already, COVID-19 crisis has sped up the whole process. So apart from this information, uh, we have been talking to Google for instance, um, that may be, for instance, a, a use case. Uh, whenever you type site items with uh, Google, they, they redirect you to another algorithm, uh, maybe Medicstore's algorithm, I don't know. Uh, there is not much there for now, but we are seeing movement around in the industry. Fantastic. Think, yeah, so companies like Google are essential partners to healthcare. They're, they invent new technologies using resources and skills and talents that we don't have in, in healthcare, whether it's, um, uh, it's, whether it's search, whether it is uh, speech to text technology, which could be a, a big part of documentation and making uh, physicians' lives better and easier, whether it's TensorFlow for, for machine learning and, and AI research and, and work. But I think a great example is um, in the context of COVID is the partnership between Google and Apple to release the uh, contact tracing API. Um, which essentially could turn on everybody's phone uh, to being a contact tracing a API tool that respects privacy and confidentiality, but dramatically increases the scale and scope of our ability to potentially understand and follow the mechanisms, incidents, prevalence, and spread of COVID throughout global populations. And that's something that um, is, is new. That is something that is instantaneously scalable given the adopt the broad adoption of, of smartphones and consumer devices. And it's something where they have the opportunity to contribute to the public health need in a way that would be incredibly, hugely a heavy lift on the public health side to do, to do things in the same way. Um, lots of, of uh, concern and lots of um, areas for for good things and for complicated things when it comes to companies like that, um, that are really data and advertising companies, but the, there's tremendous opportunity. And I think especially the contact tracing API is a, is a great example of one where those types of partnerships can lead to transformative and almost instantaneous leaps. Yeah, yeah I do believe uh, Dr. Google has a role. The problem is that you know, uh, patients need to understand how to navigate that. And I think one of the challenges we have, number one, moving forward and in incorporating technology in how we deliver care, is we have to be cautious not to fragment care even further. And, and that's one of the reasons that we, in our system, would uh, sort of encourage using MyChart uh, 
application to access telehealth. We also, as I mentioned before, use their medical record. But the biggest challenge we have often is, uh, you know, we have not paid enough attention to how we educate our patients and the technology may not be user friendly and at times has some barriers such as bandwidth and smart devices and so on. I can tell you that in the Yale Health System, we launched a telehealth on demand, a primary care telehealth uh, a program in January this year uh, after it was funded and uh, the uptick was dismal. We were seeing about three patients a day. Insurance companies were not paying for this. It was a disruption that patients didn't feel they would get care adequately. And once the pandemic hit, we were doing 5,000 cases a day. So uh, it was a silver lining. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think patient engagement as well as uh, clinician engagement was certainly uh, uh, drove, was the pandemic drove that. And I, I do believe what we, we're tasked with at this point is how can we make this seamless and user friendly so that any patient can get on it? It should be as easy as Amazon where I can buy something at a stop sign. Uh, you know, so I, I really think that's that's the task we have to focus on. Yeah, and that, that's spot on, right? I mean, really what we're talking about are implementing new strategies around the, uh, the, the, the overall technology adoption and digital transformation of our institutions. And, and along those lines, Dr. Triolo, what strategies and technologies can primary care and specialty practices adopt to improve this kind of access, uh, this kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of informational components for educating par uh, patients and providing not just the, the triage up front, but also some of the post uh, kind of ED follow-up activities. Uh, well, I think Dr. Desario um, touched on a few of them. Having an integrated and intentional care experience and care engagement with, with the healthcare system. We also use MyChart as the, as the portal for, the, for patients. And even the concept of a digital patient portal is a relatively new one, having been a part of meaningful use uh, and one of the five core pillars that really, um, really drove a lot of the adoption. So I, I think a few elements that would go into making this effective is first this patient digital experience. The Amazon analog is a good one. We need to make this a good digital experience for our patients, consumer grade digital technologies that will make it easy, that will make it uh, convenient and really reduce as many barriers as possible to patients getting the care they need, us delivering that care, and then being able to connect all the dots. Telehealth and telemedicine is clearly a, is here to stay, and that will hopefully be a permanent sea change in the way that we engage with patients and deliver care. And just like Dr. Desario and Yale, our experience was exactly the same. Um, before COVID, we were seeing 100 or 200 patients a day, mostly virtual urgent care. And then um, with um, Medicare flipping the switch on reimbursement and the other private insurers following, changes to state licensure, which is um, another aspect of digital care that I think could use a lot of innovation, um, instantaneously going to seven to 10,000 visit, uh, telehealth visits a day. Patients love this. It's, uh, physicians love it. They're learning how to do very interesting and creative things over video chat as opposed to uh, being in the clinic room with them. It's not appropriate for every visit, um, but it, it can really maintain and deliver continuity of care for potentially a huge number of, the, of these visits um, and, can, um, and, it, and it can transform things. I think the next is also a mobile first strategy for patients and how they consume their uh, interactions with us and with, with the healthcare system. And that's something that uh, I think healthcare has been later to the game than many other industries, but, but is really uh, gaming, gaining steam. Also leveraging sensors and smart devices, which are increasingly prevalent on our patients and in their homes. I, I think about Dr. Dosario's uh, uh, example in the very beginning about a patient developing AFib that was progressive and how many millions of Americans are wearing something on their wrist right now that could alert them to the development of, of AFib or paroxysmal AFib and, and how that is data that had potentially could but rarely flows in to, through the patient portal and into the EHR. I think one of the most important points here though is, is to recognize that we need to meet patients where they are, that there are lots of issues with health literacy, with numeracy, with digital literacy, 
and the sociocultural perspectives that our patients have on healthcare and on healthcare data. And I, I think that we're still in the adolescence, if you will, of digital health. And for many patients, these remain significant barriers. And, and so we'll need a lot of partnerships and research into, ensure, into ensuring that all patients across the country have access to this and across the world have access to these resources. The last thing I'll say is, and something that hasn't come up yet, is this is that there's been a lot of uh, work and, and research about bias in AI and machine learning that has creeped its way into the algorithms that underpin some of the care and the decisions that are given to patients. And equally wonderful work on how to mitigate that bias and detect it. And as we roll out all of these digital health solutions to many populations, populations that weren't used to develop them or for, which, for whom we don't have a lot of data on, we're gonna really need to be very intentional about making sure that we're doing this in a, in a way that is, um, that is recognizing of that potential bias and minimizing it as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Following uh, Dr. Triola's uh, line of thought, uh, what we envision is um, three groups of technology, of digital health technology, uh, playing uh, a key role. Some of them have been already mentioned, a remote communication channel. Uh, it can be synchronous or asynchronous. Here is telehealth, chat platforms, etc. Uh, then patient engagement solutions, digital health solutions where virtual triage lives, for instance. And lastly, uh, a third one, which is uh, digital health solutions that uh, structure the offer, uh, that somehow uh, update and create reliable data, data on uh, the providers. Uh, because eventually what, what we envision is that uh, healthcare is being disrupted like, like other uh, industries. And what's gonna be key moving forward is connecting the two key players here who are patient and doctor. And these three groups of technology are the ones that are gonna allow this smooth, uh, in, seamless interaction between both players. And regarding the strategy, uh, something that I liked a lot is uh, getting to this uh, consumer grade platform is what we call a user-friendly digital front door, right? That uh, whenever our, uh, people is seeking for care, they go to this platform, uh, this digital front door, and they feel as if they were booking uh, Uber, if they were buying something in Amazon. We want this sort of feeling of creating this ecosystem because then is when we can take advantage of this consumer reflex mentioned before, people going online looking for a solution. And, and I believe that, that this is gonna be, and, and consumers are ready to jump into it. Consumer adoption, adoption shouldn't be uh, very complicated. However, <laughs> it's true that for certain segments of population mentioned here, uh, when we were talking about the bias, vulnerable populations, el elder people, etc. Uh, health systems may think of adopting a transition strategy, which means a hybrid solution between human touch, a nurse facing solution and AI. And that's something that I believe that Dr. De Rosario has some experience uh, with these transition strategies trying to implement uh, consumer facing solutions. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> there are two other applications that we find very uh, essential at this point. We have an aging population and you know, there's no family units so for them to simply come to the doctor. They have to get, uh, they have some functional disability. They need to get uh, something to transport them, wait in the waiting room, get exposed to other things even before the pandemic. And I think that you know, the, the geography doesn't allow for house calls for, for physicians like the good old days. And so virtual house calls would be an incredible asset. What happens today when an elderly patient A complains they don't feel well uh, they call the ambulance and patients take them to the emergency room where they sit around for hours and obviously get a few other things going after that. And it's not the ideal situation. I think that if we can have virtual house calls, it, it would, they could do it themselves or we could assist them with the caregiver using a device and some, some, de some other devices that we can monitor their vital signs with, that would be really, really important. The other area that we, uh, that Vincent uh, touched on was the asynchronous telehealth. For example, as a primary care physician, I may not have the skill and expertise to interpret data on a, on a 
imaging study or in a lab data or some symptoms the patient's pre presenting to me, and I may need to speak uh, with a specialist, or generally I just make the referral. Now they have to get an appointment, there's uh, transportation again, but it might be a simple problem that I could send the data to a specialist who then communicates back with me and I can contact the patient. And we all have these resources, but we all know that in any healthcare system, getting to see a specialist is not easy uh, in, in a timely manner, but certainly asynchronous telehealth would enhance the, the ability to get them where they need to be. Yeah, and Jeff, Jeff in the audience has a question around <clears throat> some physician facing uh, solutions. Again, I think uh, he's an entrepreneur in digital health and uh, is wondering what kind of, um, you know, we've been talking about patient facing solutions so far. What kind of physician facing solutions are there out there that you all have seen that are, are successful, that are uh, showing some efficacy, both in terms of clinical efficacy on the outcome side, as well as maybe financial efficacy on the economic side? There are numerous ones, and this is, this is such an exciting area because we have gone so far beyond the human capacity of even the most brilliant physician, given the amount of data and the pace of change. If you look at all the FDA approved um, AI and machine learning uh, products, most, the majority of them are, are in deep learning in radiology and image histology and other um, image interpretation technologies. Um, others are in different types of signal processing, like atrial fibrillation detection, which, are, which is really um, one of the, the most common ones. Uh, and many of these, all of these products are really designed not to replace the physician, but to augment their human decision making, to, to allow them to, to deliver precision medicine, which is, is impossible to do as, as a human, especially when it involves um, complex genomic data or microbiomic data or all of the other um, emerging areas. So not only will these algorithms and systems help us make better decisions, if they simply help us make the same decisions faster, that would be of value um, so that we could do more with our time or we could do the same with less time, uh, if you will. And um, they could also potentially guide us to make the, uh, to making clinical decisions and treatment decisions that are reliable and consistent and value-driven, which is a key other aspect of, of improving healthcare and healthcare resources. There is plenty of um, uh, people like, like us on this panel, and I'm sure all of the uh, folks here who really are excited and want these things and are optimistic. And there are many who are fearful of, of these algorithms creating more space between us and our patients or cannibalizing the role of the, of the physician and, and even our identity. But I think that, and I, I'm curious to hear what my fellow panelists are, I'm, I'm very optimistic about these. I think they're gonna give us superpowers and that they're gonna help us um, grapple with a healthcare system right now, which is, which is tough and it is, uh, it's burdensome and it's heavy and it's not giving us the outcomes that we want given the amount of costs and resources that we're investing in it, both for us as individuals and as patients. And these could really help us enter a new era of healthcare where we're surrounded by these helpers who are giving us superpowers to make these better decisions faster and helping us connect the dots and ultimately, hopefully spend more time talking to our patients interacting with them, developing rapport, and doing the things that um, we are good at as, as physicians and as all types of care providers. That's great. Anyone else want to add on to that? Could we have a yeah, I just, I just want to say that, you know, I, I transitioned from paper charts to electronic medical records. And some of you may have never experienced paper charts. It was an absolute disaster. We used to have chart hunts in the office where 12 people were looking for one chart. And you couldn't proceed seeing the patient. But now I can work remotely. I can work from anywhere. I can access the thing. And, and also the EMRs today fire best practice advisories that prompt me to close the gaps in care, prompt me to do certain things to a patient that is due to have a preventive care. These are incredibly great uh, assets at this point. I, mean, you know, I remember at the time when I had to remember all the side effects and the drug-drug interaction. But now we only do electronic prescribing. And that will prompt me to say, wait a second, there's going to be a drug-drug interaction. I either decide to override it or change the medication. But these are things that have clearly 
improve the way we deliver care. And I think that AI and machine learning is just going to do exactly the same to the next level. It's going to help us. It's not going to replace us. It's just going to make us deliver better care. Yeah, a great, great response. We've got a, a lot of questions coming in from the gallery. And I think the, um, uh, you know, one of the, the, one of them focuses on the outlook <clears throat> that you all see in terms of replacing some of the physician administrated, uh, administered procedures with in vitro diagnostics or patient self-administered procedures and diagnostics. Uh, uh, maybe uh, someone can talk a little bit about that as well. So you're, uh, um, you're talking about the, the patient doing uh, point of care tests at home, if you will. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, certainly at HitLab, we're seeing a lot of that as, yeah. as we see uh, different technologies roll through our lab for efficacy testing. And again, the, the kinds of studies that HitLab does, the 30-day kind of IRB rapid testing, N equals 10, very quick studies, test and learns. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot of these uh, being at home because of the uh, the pandemic and because of the need for expedited use authorization. So, uh, so yeah, what, what, I mean, you know, these are really coming into fray. Remote patient monitoring is exploding obviously as well as telemedicine, which we already know about, but um, uh, what, what, from your perspectives as technology leaders, as physician leaders, et cetera, what do you see and, and how do you, is this a, a, like a temporary thing or is this something that's permanent? I think this is permanent. Um... Uh, you know, certainly a lot of this will depend upon um, sustained changes in policy and reimbursement, but uh, all, all signs point to this being a permanent shift in, in things. I think that there's really two things that, that, that you were just mentioning, essentially asynchronous home-based testing and then synchronous home-based testing for, um, for point of care diagnostics that are, aug are used to augment telehealth and telemedicine. So the, these would be situations where that patient is, um, it has a device at home, oftentimes mailed to them for, for the purposes of that telehealth or telemedicine visit where they're doing a fundoscopic exam or incentive spirometry on that lung transplant patient. Um, and the, the uh, physician or nurse is, is watching and gathering that data in real time and giving guidance to the patient to ensure that they're getting what they need and can give feedback to that patient. And as you mentioned, it is remarkable over the past few years, how much of the technologies, which used to cost tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars and were only in the hospital, are now becoming inexpensive consumer grade devices, which need um, certainly, which need to be validated and reliable and consistent and, um, and safe as they would as if they, if they were in the hospital. The other more exciting frontier is point of care home testing. And wouldn't that be great if that were ubiquitous for COVID, the whole point of, of testing is to not expose yourself in that situation and not bring people into healthcare settings to get tested. Um, and so that decentralization would be really key. I think it's, it's interesting because increasingly in the United States, patients are being empowered to consume a lot of these tests in ways that are independent of, of physicians and healthcare systems. So about half the states allow patients to order and purchase their own blood tests without any physician order. Um, and they can go and, and they can buy the tests that they want and get them. And it really does raise the question and the specter of appropriateness of testing, of, of shifting the burden of cost to patients, because in most cases, those are not covered by insurance. Um, and of what is our role as a healthcare system, as physicians, to be accountable for the outcomes of, the, of those tests when, um, when they are being conducted and ordered not by us and not in that. And, and I, think that that's, I think that's a reality. And I think patients deserve to have some autonomy in this as long as, they, um, as long as we help them make good choices around all of this stuff. But how exciting um, would it be that would transform chronic disease monitoring and management? It might even transform our understanding of, of diseases because so much of our our perspective on them is based on these intermittent biopsies of sampling of data, blood pressure, glucose, et cetera. And switching to a real-time streaming model at home is gonna change a lot of things and be quite disruptive. Yeah, uh, that's a wonderful answer. Anyone else want to uh, chime in on that? We have about- I think, I think uh, devices at home and point of care testing is really going to be huge uh, adjuvant to how we deliver care. I mean, quite frankly, sometimes they come into the office 
just to have the hemoglobin A1C done. They can do that at home and how I react to it and what I change in their medication will depend on the hemoglobin A1C. Uh, I could have a team member uh, interact with them, which could be a nutritionist or a nurse or a care coordinator. You know, we're already doing this, for example, with uh, anticoagulation testing at home, which was huge as patients uh, who, who still use Coumadin and had to go to the lab once a month. They can do this and they have a coagulation nurse do this. So these are small steps we've taken over the last few years, but I'm sure there's going to be, and especially with some of the, uh, the devices that are being used, we could basically have a hospital at home a concept. And interestingly, one of the, uh, one of the, carriers just sent us a notice saying that they are mailing COVID tests and flu tests to the high-risk patients, uh, you know, expecting the surge. I, I, I didn't figure out how they're going to transport that because it you know, requires a certain temperature. And so, uh, but again, I think that's very thinking out of the box. I think that's how uh, we are moving in that direction. That's fantastic. We have one other question and we have about uh, five minutes left. So maybe we can uh, round up with this one. Uh, and again, for any of the audience, please do reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, if you have any questions to follow up, uh, again, the panelists are all very active on social media, being uh, digital uh, uh, and, and uh, technophiles, if you will. Um, and, and certainly uh, would love to continue the conversation, I'm sure. But uh, one of the questions coming in from the audience is around you know, the, really the major challenge. So we've talked in detail about some of the uh, patient tools for front end uh, we, uh, of uh, the, the kind of patient experience. We talked about some of the, the physician tools are, that are available and then some of the at home tools, et cetera. But from a global standpoint, coming back up to the 30,000 foot level, what are some of the major challenges that physicians and health providers in general are gonna face in 2021 and 2022? And, and Dr. DeVersario, let's start with you in, in that one. So I think the major challenge will be, as, as Dr. Triola mentioned, is this going to be sustainable, you know, because if CMS, uh, beyond the public health emergency, will they, will they endorse it? Will, uh, will the commercial payers pay for it? That's the biggest barrier. The second barrier, quite frankly, is simply that we need technology that's very user-friendly and we need tools that patients can engage in. I think those are the two main challenges I see. I think if we overcome the reimbursement, we can have a long-term strategy. We can invest in, in building this platform and, and mode of uh, healthcare delivery. I think that's where we need to be. Um, I believe that one of the main challenges is gonna remain how to provide personalized healthcare guidance. And if we think of what's gonna happen beyond the pandemic, right, 2021, 2022, uh, one of the key things that we know that is gonna stay for sure, and we have mentioned this already, is telehealth. Uh, the rate of satisfaction among users and also doctors is very high. Uh, so this is going to create some sort of big question mark for health systems. They are going to be able to answer the follow-up question, when is going to be uh, more efficient and more beneficial in the long term for the patient, a, tele a telehealth visit or an in-person visit? Are they going to be equivalent at some point? Of course, there are situations that during the pandemic uh, were held uh, via telehealth because it was not possible for the patient to go to the doctor. I'm thinking of those situations where uh, doctors may lay hands on the patient, but there is plenty of more situations that now uh, there's going to be a true option between telehealth and in-person. Before the pandemic, the use of telehealth was marginal. Now it's not marginal and it's not going to be marginal in the future. So. What's going to be the answer to this? And the thing is that uh, healthcare guidance has not been able to answer this question yet. We are working a lot on that and actually we expect to develop some best practices related to this use case along with Dr. De Rosario and, and his team and hopefully be able to share it with, with the rest of, of health systems, how to uh, determine what's better for the patient, telehealth or in-person visit. And I'll just add that wearing my education hat, education is gonna be a big challenge. All of these physicians are doing telehealth had never done it before. They're expert physicians and they know how to interact with patients, but it is a set of skills that they had to learn. And as we get out of COVID times, when, as was just said, we have the choice between telehealth and in-person, figuring out what, when to use it and how to use it and for which patients it's most appropriate will be a key skill. And similarly, as has been a, a recurring theme, 
This is complicated stuff for our patients and we need to make sure that we are supporting and educating them to be advocates for themselves and their family members, um, effective users of all of this. We can't be creating a digital divide and widening that gap among uh, different types of patients or different groups as this, as this stuff rolls forward. And I think that there is uh, a great opportunity. I think that there's such a huge optimism and commitment to this, that this education will happen and it'll be successful and effective. And we're gonna see a lot of disruption in what has been a disruptive, resistant sector of healthcare and it will get better. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Just an incredible panel today. And uh, I uh, really can't thank you all enough for joining. And again, for the audience, uh, please do stay in touch. Let us know uh, if you're interested in uh, future HitLab seminars, the HitLab Summit is coming up December one, two, and three. Uh, we have the Women's Health Tech Challenge on November 19th. And uh, again, if you're interested in taking any of my classes at Columbia, uh, you have the friends and family hit lab rate. So please do uh, link in with me or email me. I'm happy to get you into the certifications at the, the discount that I can't even announce online because the Dean would kill me. Uh, so again, uh, Dr. De Rosario, uh, Dr. Triola and Desink, thank you very much. Thank you very much to Medic Tour for sponsoring this as well and all the good work that they do to promote uh, improved patient outcomes across the digital health ecosystem, not just in the U.S., but around the world. Everybody have a great day. Have a great weekend. Stay safe.